we're still looking at occupying until he comes. Yes. And what that exactly means, what it looks like. We're looking at um, making our lives a Goshen lifestyle. And then and we get a Goshen family. Open Heaven will be a Goshen at Kasia. You know that Goshen uh, area where it doesn't matter what's happening in the world. We're living out of the kingdom of God. And the freedom of the kingdom of God flows through our lives. And this is what brings about the change. That it doesn't matter what affects the world, that we're free from it. That we're a people who live in divine health. We're a people who live with divine wisdom. And Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10 says it's the wisdom of God that they've done. Brings down principalities and powers. It's the wisdom, the manifold wisdom of God that's operating through the church that brings down principalities and powers. So we're a people who don't just see ourselves as saved. We know we're saved. And because we know we're saved, we walk in freedom. We walk in freedom. We walk in um, the power of the Holy Spirit. We walk in kingdom authority and dominion. We walk in truth. We walk in love. We walk in meekness. We walk in humility. But we also walk with a with a knowing that we live in divine health. It's not that we are healed or we're waiting to be healed, but we are divinely healthy. We walk with a divine wisdom. We walk with um, divine knowledge, divine understanding. Everything that Jesus Christ is, you are. That's what it boils down to. Everything. Jesus Christ is, you are, because you are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. So whatever is available to him is available to us. He walked this earth as a man under the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, just as we do. And the level of, of whatever level we get to depends upon our surrender to him. But whatever he achieved, you can, it says in John chapter 14, verse 12, that we will do even greater things than what he did. Whatever that looks like. But the thing is, what as he is, so are we now in this world. So, you know, we're one with him. That There's just absolutely no separation. We are one with him. But the challenge is that in this time of, of um, stuff that's going on, I just use the word, the stuff that's going on, we've got to remember that the word that the Lord gave us at the beginning of the year was that we'll occupy until he comes through wisdom, revelation, and covenant. Wisdom, revelation, and covenant. And that will cause us to have a Goshen here, that we would align with heaven's government, that we would live through the finished work of the cross, that we would live through the covenant, that uh, we would come from the victory of Christ, that we would know our identity, our position, our authority, but we would live from ascension. Yeah, come on. We live from ascension. Yes. You know, we are resurrected, but we also are ascended. We're seated with him in heavenly places, yeah. and we must learn to live from that position. Yes. So that means that we've, a lot of us have... Me included, we have to grow up. We have grow to mature. Grow up. <laughs> grow up to go up, or go up to grow up. But we have to mature in the things of God and, and look at the things of what He wants us to do. And the battlefield is the mind. That's the battlefield. Let's 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 be honest here. We give far too much glory and credence to the enemy. Jesus Christ defeated the enemy. Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. God made a public display, a triumph over the spectacle of the enemy. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. All authority. So if Jesus Christ has all authority, the devil has none. Because Jesus has all. He might have power. He's got the power of deception. He's got the power of lies. He's got power, but he has no authority. Because all the authority belongs to Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 10, verse 19, Jesus says, Behold, and he's speaking to believers. He said, Behold, I have given you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So he's saying right there that we have the ability through the authority of Jesus Christ and what he's given us that we can live above the snake line. You know what I mean by above the snake line? In America, there is a certain place in the mountains where snakes can go no, go high, but they can't go any further because if they go further and higher up the mountain, it's too cold for them and they'll die. So we can live above the snake line because for goodness sake, we're living in Christ. Yes. Right, isn't that above the snake line? Yes. The devil couldn't affect him. Right. So we're in Christ, and it says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 3, that we are hidden with Christ in God, dead to this world. So that the criteria there is to be dead to the world. But we are hidden with Christ in God. 
So we've got all the power, all authority over the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt us. Now I'm not saying that there's not warfare, I'm not saying anything like that. But what I am saying is that the enemy has been defeated. <coughs> he has been defeated. So to, to me, then that means that the real warfare is in my mind. Because that's when God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 that we are to use the weapons of God to bring down the mind, the strongholds of the mind. If you want to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. There is coming a, a, an anointing and a mantle upon this ecclesia that some of you have not tasted of before. It's going to be new, it's going to be different. There's a pioneering mantle. It is a pioneering mantle that he's putting upon this ecclesia. And you will be doing things that you actually, this mantle that he's throwing upon open heaven is an invitation to step into the impossible. Come on. He's inviting you to step into the impossible because all things are possible with our God. And so there is a mantle that is coming upon this, this ecclesia. There is an expansion that is coming to it. But I speak over it right now that only those that God has called will come. Yeah. And that those who would cause trouble and strife will be elect, will be ejected in Jesus' yeah. name. They will not be able to stay. The ones that are, will flow with the Holy Spirit, the ones that will grow in conformity to the Holy Spirit. But I'm telling you that there is a, a mantle that's coming and not just for prayer and intercession. Because that is one of our main things. But the other thing that is coming upon this church is a mantle to walk into the impossible. Yeah. To call forth those things that are not as if they are. <coughs> to call forth the possible out of the impossible. The fact that when you see something that says impossible, it's simply saying, I'm possible. Yeah. And this is an invitation for God to, for, from God for you to step into something that is new and different. And it is an invitation to shake off the things of the world. It's an invitation to get rid of living as a human being. It is an invitation to rise up into the amount of the anointing of Christ to step into things that he has done and will do and continue to do. It is an anointing and an invitation for you to let go of the things that keep you down and will lift you up in Jesus' name that you might truly represent God's kingdom and God's king. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We are not leaving that word without Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. 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 Thank because we're going to hear some things from the Spirit and we're going to say, that doesn't make sense. It is not supposed to make sense. It is supposed to be spiritual. It will make God sense, but not common sense. Oh, so good. This is so good. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Verse 4 says, The weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. So the weapons of our warfare are not necessarily for the enemy, but for the strongholds that would hold us back, the strongholds that would stop the move of God, the strongholds that will stop revival, the strongholds that will cause tradition to be exalted above freedom. This is what we've got to understand. The, web, the, the battlefield is in us. It's in us. The kingdom of God is in us, but so is the battlefield. It's in our mind. And what we don't understand is that, that we often yield to that. We often yield to what we what has framed our lives rather than what has freed our lives. Oh, that was good. Framed or freed. <laughs> framed or freed. So, um, I mean, I have got such an urgency to get this across, but I don't know how to get it across. The Holy Spirit's going to have to do it because we have to change. Yeah. We have to change. <clears throat> Um, the the scripture I'm, I'm reading from the Amplified uh, that same verse the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses yeah. and the fortresses are like like of course strongholds but the fortresses are for are for self protection yes. And those have to come down because we must deny ourselves. 
lives. Yeah. Those must come down. Yeah. Um, the Lord spoke to me about strongholds many, many, many years ago. And he said, just like Joshua, Joshua went to the stronghold, he went to the fortress, he went to the main town, and he conquered that stronghold. And all the outlying areas of those strongholds in our life, and, and, and this is how he explained it with Joshua, that Joshua conquered the stronghold, and then all the outlying areas fell in. So all the outlying areas that come with that stronghold in our lives will fall away once that stronghold is conquered. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah, so it's about taking down the strongholds. I've got the Amplified Classic. You must have the new Amplified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, one is fortresses, one is strongholds. But the thing is, that is what we use the, the weapons of God for. We refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God and lead every thought and purpose away into the captivity of Christ, into his captivity. Now, we looked last week at 3 John, whenever last time I spoke on this, at 3 John 2, that above all things, he wrote, I want you, above all things, I want you to prosper and I want you to live in health, even as your soul prospers. Yeah. So the prosperity of your soul will release your health. The prosperity of your soul will release your wealth. Yeah. So what is a prosperous soul? It is one that is in alignment and in, a tune and in agreement with God. And it's not just your conscious mind or your subconscious. It is your imagination. Yeah. It is your imagination that builds the strongholds or the fortresses. It's your imagination. That, that goes into self-protection mode. It's your imagination that paints a negative picture. It's your imagination that can paint a godly picture, but it's your imagination. And let me tell you how I know when you're operating out of imagination, I can tell. Just as you can tell when you talk to me. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? So we can, we can fake it with scripture, because we know the scriptures. We know what we should say. Who knows that we know what we should say? Oh, yes. And we can speak it for a little bit. But after about 10 minutes or so, what is in there actually comes out. And if there is no peace, it comes out. If there is worry, it comes out. If there is frustration, it comes out. If there is pain in the body, it comes out. Because the imagination has not been transformed into a godly imagination. So I don't know, you know, the, the rents are going up. Um, incomes are not going up, but the rents are going up, and, and all these things are happening. So, you know, people are talking about, I don't know how, you know, well, I'm just believing God. Everything's going to be God. He's never let us down. And then about five minutes into the conversation, well, I don't know, we could do this, or we could go there, or we could do that. Which means there is no peace, there is no rest if you have not heard from God. It also means that your imagination is still carnal and is guiding you in a way that is contrary to the things of God. I'm going to bring this out. Imagination is so powerful because 3 John 2, above all things, he said, I want you to prosper and live in health even as your soul prospers. So if your soul is not prospering, you're not going to be healthy or as healthy as you can be and you won't be as wealthy as you can be. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. So the heart, the prosperous soul, as I think in my heart, what do I think in my heart, you know? Um, I used to think, because I was divorced and all of that, I used to think I'm going to get in first and say goodbye before you do. Right? So the, the, the relationship or the friendship would go so far, and then I'm thinking, okay, I'm not 100% sure here, so I'm just going to say goodbye now. So I could just very quickly opt out of a relationship without thinking about it, because I'm not going to be hurt again like I was when I was divorced. And that was my imagination that had set that self-protection in place. So that took a lot of work to, to come out of that. So I'm just being honest, okay? <laughs> but Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep and guard your heart. Again, the heart. Keep and guard your heart with all vigilance and above all that you guard. For out of it flow the springs of life. So 3 John 2 says, Above all things, I want you to prosper and live in health as your soul prospers. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep and guard your heart with all vigilance and above all that you guard, for out of it flow the springs of life. So what we think, what we dream, what we imagine sets the boundaries of our life. And, you know, my, my, and I've used my dad before. I love my dad. I honour my dad. 
and he really wanted to take really good care of us when he was alive. But the only way he could see to provide for his family was to win lotto. Right? So every week he put in the money for the lotto. It was the only way. He was a blue collar worker. You know, I had to borrow money when I got married. I had to borrow money to put his son through, through university. He was a hard worker but never really got ahead. Honest as the day is long but never really quite got the break. And so um, the only way he could see to progress or, or to get anything for the family was lotto. And every week he'd work out how much he could win and then he'd work out how much he would give to himself, to my brother and me, to his grandchildren, to his great-grandchildren. He'd work it all out. And the next week we'd go through the whole thing again because that was that was his fortress. It was the only way he could see that he could get ahead. But if he had put that money aside, I probably would be better off, you know. But he didn't put that money aside. He bought. But and but the amazing thing is, he only uh, isn't it, Danielle? Every week he won enough to pay for the next lot of lotto. <laughs> <laughs> but he never, he never got out of it what he wanted. But what you think, dream, or imagine sets the boundaries of your life. Mm. What you think, what you dream, and what you imagine sets the boundaries of your life. So do not believe everything that you think. Mm -hmm. Do not believe everything that you think. Because not everything will be true. Not everything will be in alignment with the Word of God. Not everything. Some things will come out of hurt. Some things will come out of self. So don't think. Don't believe everything that you think. And I want to say one thing about open heaven. Um, I, I believe, well, I know it to be so, that God has called open heaven ministries to be a sanctuary for Him and for people. A sanctuary for God and for people, a safe place for people. So please, if you see people doing stuff that you don't agree with, pray, but don't speak to them. Pray. Let the Holy Spirit do the cleaning. If we start to correct, what we're doing is, is we've got one finger so I can see what's wrong with them and then three fingers are pointing back at us. For goodness sake, if you see somebody doing something that is not right, just pray for them. Father, would you show them the truth? Father, would you help them? Father, would you bless them? But please do not co correct. That's not our place. It's the Holy Spirit to give conviction. And as the pastor, I'm more than happy to say unpleasant, uncomfortable things, but I will do it with love. But please, let this be a sanctuary for people and for God. This must be a place of love, not a place <coughs> of correction. <coughs> love will bring correction. Encourage you can encourage but not correct because I've had a number of people come to me in the last few weeks and say I really don't want to come anymore because I'm being corrected mm -hmm. and it's not about correction it is about love let the Holy Spirit do what he does okay so do not believe everything that you think so when I was a life coach the conscious mind roughly five to ten percent would uh, affect your life. So what you consciously think, what you're aware of what you're thinking, well, I don't like what Suzette just said, or I don't like this, or I don't like that, or oh, do anything for piece of pizza right now, whatever it might be. The <laughs> conscious thought only affects your life about 5%. 95, 90 to 95% of your decisions have already been made in your subconscious. You are unaware of them, but they are uh, strongholds. They are things that we've, we've, you know, well, I don't like green. I've got, I had a friend who couldn't stand the colour green, so every time I wore green, the first thing out of her mouth would not be hello. It would be, I can't stand the colour green. <laughs> but it's, it comes down to the subconscious mind is the thoughts that you are not aware of. And they influence you 90 to 95% of the time. So really, 90 to 95 percent of the time, we live a life that is on autopilot. And in that 90 to 95 percent is the power of your imagination, mm. your perception. Albert Einstein said, "Imagination is everything. 
It is the preview of life's coming attractions. What you imagine <laughs> is, what, is what happens. And let me tell you how imagination is so powerful. In Genesis chapter 11, I really want you to get this. I really want you to get this. In Genesis chapter 11, you know, it is the Tower of Babel, verse 2. And as they journeyed eastward, Genesis 11, verse 2. As they journeyed eastward, they found a plain valley in the land of Shinar, and they settled and dwelt there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. So they had brick the stone and slime and bitumen for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build us a city and a tower whose top reaches into the sky, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered over the whole earth. So they're looking for self-protection, self-promotion, um, self-preservation. They really want to, they want to reach their heavens their way, not for God's way. And in verse 5, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Verse 6, the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, they have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and now nothing they have imagined they can do will be impossible for them. Nothing they have imagined they can do will be impossible for them. And it's, it's true in a corporate setting, and it's true individually. Just look at some of the, um, the people, like um, Bill Gates. He was so determined that he could do something, you know, his own way with computers. That he imagined, he imagined things. So this unregenerate group of people, they were not believers, they were anti-God. They had come together, they had imagined that they could do something and it caused such a, a, a threat to the plans of God that he actually had to come down and deal with it. Do you understand how powerful imagination is? Yeah. They were unregenerate, unredeemed sinners, anti-God, anti-everything. And yet God says nothing they have imagined will be impossible for them. And they posed such a threat to God's plan that he came down to sort it out. So what would a godly imagination do? What would a godly imagination be like? This is nothing they have imagined will be impossible for them. In Psalm 103, verse 14, Psalm 103, verse 14, the word imagination is actually six times in the Old Testament. So Psalm 103, verse 14, says, for he knows our frame. He knows our frame. He remembers the imprints on his heart that we are dust. God knows our frame. That word means imagination. So our imagination frames our life. Our imagination frames your future. The imagination that we have of whether or not we're going to be sick as we get older or whether or not we live from the power of Christ's indestructible life on the inside of us. That imagination, whichever way it goes, is going to frame our future. It frames our present. God knows our frame. He knows the power of the imagination. It's what we step into. It's what is released through us. It's the picture that we paint. It's the vision that we have for ourselves. Am I making sense? Yes. It's really, really important that you understand that it's your imagination. When it talks about renewing your mind, what he's saying there is if you renew your mind to the point that your imagination is completely overhauled. Your life will be totally transformed. So Psalm 103 verse 14, that word, he knows our frame, is actually imagination. I think it's Strong's H3336, I think. So turn to Genesis 6-5. So I want you to start thinking, what, what does your imagination paint? Is it, you know, what is your imagination painting about your future? What do you actually see when you think about your future? 
Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination and intention of all human thinking was only evil continually, or was bent on evil continually. That the imagination of our thoughts, the imagination of our thoughts, Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. When the Lord smelled the pleasing odour, this is um, Noah had set up the, an altar to the Lord. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing odour, a scent of satisfaction to his heart, the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the imagination the strong desire of man's heart is evil and wicked from his youth. Neither will I ever again smite and destroy every living thing as I have done. I will never again curse the ground because of man for the imagination of man's heart. See, this is the this is what we've not looked at. We've looked at, you know, well, Satan must be doing this and Satan must be doing that and Satan's released confusion and Satan's released that. He's defeated. We walk in authority over him. I'm not saying that, you know, he doesn't go down without a fight, but we walk in authority, kingdom, dominion over the works of the enemy. But what we have to actually battle with is, is our thinking and, and the way that we paint our future. You know, and when with so much happening in the world around us and the things that, the, the strikes that are happening over in the Middle East and, and, um, and the Houthis and, you know, all of that kind of thing, the rents going up, um, all sorts of things on, on, in Australia. What is your imagination painting a picture of? Are you nervous about where you're going to live when the, the lease is up? Do you think it's ever, ever going to be possible for you to have your own home? Like, what is, what, when you, when you look into the future, what do you actually see? Because somebody has said to me, they've been ill, and they said, I've been, I've been, you know, saying the scriptures, I've been saying and saying and saying the scriptures. Well, it's not about saying the scriptures, it's about believing them. And then it goes past believing to knowing. I can believe something, but when I know it, I, it can't be taken from me. Yeah. Right? So I can believe that I've been healed by the stripes of Jesus, or I can know I've been healed by the stripes of Jesus, which is a different level of, of can, uh, faith and perception again. And then it can go past that to, well, I just live in divine health. It's not a question of being healed. It's not a question of manifesting wholeness. It's, well, I live in divine health. I live from the power of Christ's endless, indestructible life on the inside of me. I live in divine health. That's that's the next level. So we've got to recognize where we are because, if, you know, if you go to the doctor and they say something, you can either get, take it, receive it, or you can go, no, that's not true. Because I live in divine health. No, that's not true. Christ's life flows through me. It's impossible for me to be sick. Impossible. I might be opportunities to fight it, but in the reality of it, the truth of it, if we truly are as Christ is, so are we in this world, but there is that opportunity for us to live in that place. Look at John G. Lake. He lived in that place of divine health. They put the, the germs in his hand of the plague and they just died because he was so full of divine life. Now I can't remember who it was. I don't know whether I don't know who it was. I don't know whether it was F. F. Bosworth or somebody. But he couldn't die. He was so full of the spirit of life, he couldn't die. And he knew it was time to go home, but he couldn't die. There was too much life on the inside, like too alive with the life of Christ. So he actually called um, some people in ministry to come and pray for him. And, and they had to pray that the life would ebb away so that he could go home. So they came and they prayed for a few hours, day one. They came the next day, day two, and he says, no, I'm not ready to go yet. There's still too much life on the inside. <coughs> Day three, they prayed. He says, it's okay, I can go home now. So why aren't we living at that level when that's what God has provided for us? 
Why are we not living in divine prosperity where it doesn't matter what it costs because we can just access the kingdom of God and know that our God, El Shaddai, the great and mighty one, the one who holds the, the, the key of wealth in his hands, Jehovah Kail, the God of wealth, he can just release what we need. We go through this song and dance, well, I've tithed and I've offered. So, Jesus died on the cross and destroyed poverty. Jesus died on the cross and destroyed the world's economy. Jesus died on the cross and destroyed Babylon. Jesus died on that cross and destroyed hell. So why are we not living a heavenly lifestyle? And I'm not cranky at you. (laughs) But it's just this frustration because I know that we're living so far below what he has given us. So far below. You know I love the, the Old Testament guys, the, not the Old Testament guys, the old guys. The guys that when their heads were cut off, they would pick up their heads. The several of fours and they would continue to preach. You know, St. Xavier, when he got off the boat and when his foot touched ground, the plague left the town and everybody saw the plague leave the town. The soldiers, the Roman soldiers who were stripped naked and shoved out on a lake, and told and they had fires burning along the river bank and it was a frozen lake and there was there was furs and there was food and the aromas wafting and they said to them all you have to do is deny jesus christ and you can come back we'll restore you back into caesar's army you can have a meal we'll give you the furs you can be restored back out of all of those soldiers that were kneeling naked on the lake only one ran off and and renounced Christ, but as he did, one of the soldiers that was uh, armed along the bank stripped himself of everything and went out and knelt on that lake and took his place. Because even when they were persecuted, they released such such a thing that the people wanted what they had. You know, we live a lifestyle that reflects the kingdom of God. The people in the world will be like immigrants, like we'll do anything to get into the kingdom of God, but we're not living it. We're not living a lifestyle that, that, in, that intrigues them. We're not living a lifestyle that, that invites them to come in. We're not living a lifestyle where they'll do anything to get into the kingdom of God. It is coming. But the, the, so we have to change what's in here. We have to change the way we think. You have to see yourself in full possession of everything that Jesus Christ died to give us. Full possession. You are an heir of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 17. You are an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ, which means everything Jesus had belongs to you. Which means everything the Father has, you have access to. There is no shortage. There is no lack. There is when we think there is. But when we think from the mind of Christ, there is no lack. We live in abundance. Because Jesus said, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came to give you life and life more abundant. So where where do these thoughts come from? It comes from your imagination. That's why we have to meditate the word of God until you actually see yourself living it. Is this making sense? You have to pick up the art of meditation again. If you want to move on to Deuteronomy 31, 21. And we're going to look at somebody who could not change his imagination and lost everything. Next week we'll look at someone who changed their imagination and got everything. But this week we'll deal with the, the one first. Deuteronomy 31, 21. When many evils and troubles have befallen them, the sacred song will confront them as a witness, for it will never be forgotten from the mouths of their descendants, for I know their imagination and their purpose. Some translations say, I know their strong desire, which they are forming even now, for for I brought them into the land which I swore to give them. 1 Chronicles 28. 1 Chronicles 28. Twenty-eight. First Chronicles twenty-eight. So, uh, 
verse 9. It's not in my translation, but it will be in others. And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a blameless heart and a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and minds and understands the wanderings of the thoughts. The Lord searches the imagination. Is that in your translation? Yeah, it is, it's H336, it actually means imagination. Mm -hmm. And First Chronicles 29, 18. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts, imaginations, in the minds of your people and direct and establish their hearts, their imaginations towards you. Mm. The imagination is the frame of your life. You will never live outside of the frame of your imagination. It's a boundary. Proverbs 4.23, it's, it's, it's a boundary. So if you want to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13, we're going to look at King Saul. 1 Samuel 13. Verses 13 to 14. King Saul had an amazing call, but he also had an amazing downfall. There was never meant to be a King David. Which sort of blows your mind, doesn't it, with all the psalms that he wrote and everything else. And yet it says in scripture that there was never meant to be a King David. King Saul was to be it forever. So in um, 1 Samuel 13, verse 13, Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. There should never have been a David. Verse 14, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince and ruler over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. The Lord would have established your kingdom, King Saul, over Israel forever. So it makes you question, what is it in my life that I have lost because I have not changed my imagination? And let me tell you something, and this is going to upset some people, but you love me. And I love you. King Saul had prophecies. He stepped into his anointing, his kingship, based on prophecies. How many of us have had prophecies? Both hands, both feet. Prophecies. How many of us have received all the prophecies that were spoken over us? No. Not yet. <laughs> King Saul, even though he was prophesied over by Samuel, did not walk in the prophecies that he was given because he did not change his imagination. So when you get a prophecy, it is an invitation for you to change your imagination, to change the way you see things, to respond differently. Am I making sense? <coughs> it's gone very quiet. But King Saul had, had prophecies. You have no idea where God wants to raise you guys up to. You, he wants to raise you up. There is such a call and such an anointing upon each and every one of you. He is wanting to raise you up. There's, there's positions for you to take. There are words for you to speak out. There are things for you to possess, things for you to step into, things for you to carry out for his glory. And you are, each and every one of you are called, you're anointed. And there are, there's such a call on you to be raised up and to be released. But until we, we see things differently in our imagination, it's not going to happen. We have to meditate the word, meditate the promises, meditate the prophecies. So King Saul had amazing prophecies from the best prophet in town, Samuel. 
And still, he didn't walk it out. He did not receive the prophecies that were spoken to him. Because there was something on the inside of him, his frame, God remembers our frame, his frame, which is made up of his imagination. He did not change it to go with the call. Am I making sense? So it's okay. Whatever, wherever we're at, we say, God, I repent, I renounce, I'm ready to start over, start again. Show me what you want, okay? Don't wear any condemnation, don't wear any guilt. But be aware that sometimes the reason we've not stepped into what he's given us is because we have no imagination or it's the wrong imagination. So, you know, I've been waiting for God to provide us with a venue. I'm believing God for a venue. No more believing God for a venue. We now have it. Right? We have it. I see it in my... I see it. We have a venue. We're in it. And so in the spiritual realm, this, this is the change that needed to happen. So King Saul, taking him as an example, in verse 13 of chapter Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 13, Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You've not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. The prophecies that have been spoken over your life, you could have had forever. But now, but now, your kingdom shall not continue. And we'll put it in, into our perspective. But now, Susie, you can't have what was spoken over you. For the Lord has sought out someone else, a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince and ruler over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So with every prophecy, there is commands. I don't know if you're aware of that or not, but I really dislike getting prophecies. Thank you. I mean, I like good. I like getting them, but I'm also aware that when I get a prophecy, it's going to mean hard work. What the prophecy is saying is, Suzette, there's a place for you, but you're not the woman here to walk it out. You've got, you've got some things to lay down, some things to pick up. It's like you're going on a new journey. God's saying, okay, now I want you to do this. You've got the, the staff of perception and you're going to be cutting through the bush. And I'm thinking, God, I'm a city girl. I love God and God. You know, but now I'm hacking my way through the bush. Oh, Lord. But so there's, there's, a, there's things that has to change on the inside of me so I can grow into the prophecy. That prophecy wasn't given to me because I'm ready for it. That prophecy was given because God is saying, this is the future, this is where I'm taking you, so I need you to change. I need you to lay down some stuff. I need you to learn some stuff, pick up some stuff. It's a different journey. You're going to have to unpack some baggage and you're going to have to pack some different things, some new things, different anointings to go with where I'm taking you. I'm going to have to learn how to use a machine. Cut through the underbrush. You know, but with problems, do you know what I'm saying? But we receive a prophecy and we think, well, that's it. But it's not it. We think we've received a prophecy and we're just going to step into it. No. I would love, yes. But we have to change to grow into it. It's always a bit of hard. Because if I'm picking up that staff of perception, and I am, I say, yes, Lord. Well, maybe some of the ways that I have perceived things in the past will no longer be accurate or be the way God wants me to, to move in this season. Right? It's different. You get a prophecy, God is saying, I'm calling you to change. I'm calling you to grow into this prophecy. This is the future that I have for you. But you have to grow into it. You have to see yourself living in it. It's not enough to say, I've got this prophecy. Because I used to say that. I've got this prophecy. I've got this prophecy. 20 years ago. 30 years ago. I still got the prophecy. But I've never walked it out. Because sometimes we think it's a given. Other times we think, I don't know what we think other times. Sometimes I think, well, that's a given. Yep, got that. Yes, Lord. And time passes and you go, Lord, where did that go? Mm. And I can always remember learning this from uh, Marcus Bishop, a pastor that came to Australia the first time Creflo Dollar did. And Marcus was talking about this. He was tall, blonde, blue-eyed, travelling everywhere with Creflo Dollar. And he was, you know, he was just saying that he, he was going with Creflo into places that he could never go as a, as a white preacher. 
that he was reflecting one day about his beautiful wife and his wonderful children and this fabulous church that God had given him. And oh God, I'm just so grateful. Just so grateful, God. And God spoke to him and said, you weren't my first choice. <laughs> and he said, surely the second, third. I think he was around about the 13th or 14th choice. God had offered that course. See, when you get, the gifts of God mm. are given. Our life is gift wrapped with his gifts. But the call of God is an invitation. You can say yes or no. And, and so many others had said no before Marcus Bishop said yes. Wow. And so sometimes I can look at things that God had prophesied over me and I can look around and I can see man, it's, it's in that ministry over there <coughs> because I lost it. Is this too painful up front for you people? No, it's truth. It's truth. I want you to walk in the prophecies that you've got that are, that are still relevant for you. But it's not a given. Saul was prophesied over by Samuel. Saul was prophesied. In fact, he said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, Saul, you're going to become a different man. But Saul didn't stay a different man. He reverted back to who he was instead of allowing the prophecy to pull him into the future that God had there. See, prophecy is to pull you into something. So I don't want anybody feeling sad because we can easily pray and, and you know, sort of move back into position. Have a look in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. But if we don't know the truth, we're not going to be free. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> so 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. This is the truth. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Becherath, the son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of wealth and valor. And Kish had a son named Saul, a choice young man and handsome. Among all the Israelites, there was not a man more handsome than he. He was a head taller than any of the people. But the lie that Samuel believed about himself is found in verse 21. Samuel said, am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? Now, it's true that the Benjamin, tri Benjamin tribe was the smallest. And is not my family the least of all the families of the clans of Benjamin? Why then do you speak to me this way? His, his family was not the smallest. His father was a mighty man of wealth and valor, it says in verse, in verse 1. So he had a misconception about himself. And remember when they anointed him king and, the, and they were looking to, to crown him as king? Where was he? He was hiding with the luggage. He was hiding with the baggage. He was hiding because he had a low self-esteem. He was not prepared to step into the prophetic words that Saul had put, Samuel had put upon his life. He had received the prophecy. He had turned into another man, but he didn't stay a different man. He reverted back to who he used to be. And so when it came time to anoint him in front of the people, he's hiding. Because he still saw himself as, as nobody. And yet he was handsome, he was tall, his father was a mighty man of wealth and valour, yet that's not what Samuel saw. So the question that I'm asking each and every one of us is, what, again, what lies are we believing about ourselves or our provision? What lies are we believing that is stopping the truth of the prophetic word, the truth of the promises of God, the truth that God has called you and has raised you up and you are ascended and seated far above all the plans of the enemy. What is the lie that is stopping you from walking in the fullness of everything that God's got? What is the lie that is stopping you from living a life of divine health? What is the lie that is stopping you from living a life of, of marital bliss or... or whatever, you know, like having your own business. What is the lie that is stopping you? And as quick as you ask, God will tell you. And sometimes people get, God's not speaking to me. Oh, that's the lie. That's the lie. And then you ask, God, well, what is the truth? 
What is the truth about my health? What is the truth about my finances? What is the truth about my business? What is the truth about the prophecies that have been spoken over me? What is the truth about my life? Tell me the truth. Man, he's more than happy to let you know. He will give you a revelation of who you are. He will give you a revelation of your, your position in Christ. He'll give you a revelation of his plans and purposes for you. That will just blow you out of the water. And it will just become a part of you. It will just like, wow. You know, a revelation and you've got it. But so what often happens is we know the promises. You can tell me the promises. Mm -hmm. Well, I know God's words is this. I know that I've been healed by his stripes. I know that he'll meet every need that I have. I know whatever it might be. But it's more like information instead of revelation. And when you have revelation, revelation brings transformation. But information is simply that, head knowledge. Information is stuff that we can be talked out of. Information is something that just sits there. But revelation is when it starts to change on the inside of you and your imagination starts to get transformed. And you start to see things differently. I know, I know. There is a place in God where you live above the snake line. Mm. I know it. I know it. I know that there is a place in God where there's no backlash, no counterattack because you've stepped out, because you prayed. There's, there shouldn't be. If you've stepped out in Christ, in the strategies of God, success. So there might be obstacles, there might be challenges. But I don't see that. I see the success. Like not one weapon formed against me can prosper. And every tongue raised against me, judgment is condemned. <coughs> That's my heritage. Nothing can talk me out of that. It doesn't matter what's coming at me. It might look like an atomic bomb is coming straight for me. But I know that it cannot prosper. It might be formed, but it cannot go off. So what do you see? In the area that is disturbing you, in the area where you just have not been able to get the total victory, what is it that you actually see? Or feel? Or hear? Because I'm telling you, God wants you to live the truth, which brings absolute freedom. And it's the imagination that makes the difference. But let me just finish with King Saul. Because if ever a man had the opportunity to succeed, he did. Mm. And like, like Leah, and it's Leah's birthday today too. Mm. <laughs> Happy birthday, Leah. Um, it, it's, it's often what's been, we've heard as a child, and we've taken that as a truth, and it's laid in our soul. And it's built the fortress. Yeah. So those things need to be just capped off, revealed, taken away. So we're going to do some prayer tonight. So um, turn to First Samuel chapter ten, verse one. This is the truth. Samuel took the vial of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him and said, "Hasn't the Lord anointed you to be prince over His heritage, Israel?" Now go to verses six and seven. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily, and you'll show yourself to be a prophet with them, and you'll be turned into another man. And when these signs meet you, do whatever you find to be done, for God is with you. And verse 10, And when they came to the hill, behold, a band of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came mightily upon him, and he spoke under divine inspiration among them. He became another man. He was anointed as a prophet. He was anointed as he was going to be anointed as a king. And um, and then you see in First Samuel chapter ten, verse twenty-two, when they're looking for Saul um, to anoint him, for Samuel to anoint him. It says in verse 22, they inquired of the Lord further if the man would yet come back. And the Lord answered, Behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. He has hidden himself. It wasn't any, it was his, he hid himself. How many times have we sabotaged ourselves? I have. 
Man, it was like Suzette Sabotage Tordy for a while there. Like it was my middle name, you know, like I was, like I'd look around, nobody else had done it, I just sabotaged something else. The Suzette Sabotage Tordy. But, you know, but we do, we, we have a self sabotage thing within us that God is wanting to shift. And if you turn over to 1 Samuel 15 7. Sorry, 1 Samuel 15, 17. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 17. Samuel is speaking to Saul, and he said, When you were small in your own sight, when, this, when you didn't see yourself the way God saw you, when you saw yourself the way you thought you were, not the way God saw you as a, as a changed man, as a king, as, as one who could minister with the prophets, when you still saw yourself, you saw yourself the way you've always seen yourself, small in your own sight. So there are areas in our lives and we see ourselves not as God sees us. And that comes out in fear, worry, anxiety, uh, anger, hopelessness. It reveals itself in a whole lot of you know, negative emotions. Well, God will answer their prayers, but I never seem to see God doing much in mine. You know, these kinds of things that we think. And so these are areas that we need to be aware of. His imagination of himself, even though he had been anointed by Samuel, even though he was called to be a king whose dynasty would last forever, the imagination, the picture that he had painted of himself still caused him to be small in his own sight and to lose the destiny that God had put upon him. His imagination continued to frame his life. He didn't change his imagination. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 20, just running through some scriptures, we're going to look at the importance of your heart, which is where the imagination really is painted from, the heart. 1 Samuel 12, 20, Samuel said to the people, Fear not, you have indeed done all this evil, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve him with all your heart. Verse 24, only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. But consider how great are the things he's done for you. And I don't know about you, but in this Greece Howells intercessor, who, that idea that I had that that would be a good thing for us to study. Oh, because the thing that keeps coming up to me is um, the Holy Spirit said to Reese Howells, I don't want any cross currents in your life. Just me. And I'm, I'm this week is sort of like, oh my gosh, Lord, how many cross currents can I actually throw in? <laughs> you know, like God, purify me. All I want is your current, your river flowing through my life. But just the way he said, I don't want any, no mix, no mix. So God, purify us, purify us. So in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 8, Saul waited um, for Samuel seven days. And Samuel had not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from Saul. So Saul made a lot of decisions based upon what he saw. So Saul said, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering, which he was forbidden to do. And just as he finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet and greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattering from me, and you didn't come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines were assembled at Big Mash. So he had all these excuses. The imagination that he carried of himself as a small man, that people wouldn't stay loyal to him, that he couldn't really be king, destroyed his destiny. 1 Samuel 15, 17. Great call, amazing downfall. First Samuel 15, 17, and we just finish with these few scriptures. Samuel said, When you were small in your own sight, were you not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed you king over Israel. Where are you still small in your own sight? Is it to do with finances? Is it to do with your health? Is it to do with relationships, family? Where are you still small in your own sight? 1 Samuel 15, verse 22. Samuel said, Has the Lord so great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, 
and to hearken than the fat of rams, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as idolatry. And because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Quite often when we reject the word of the Lord, he rejects. Well, we, we take on a consequence. We take on a consequence. Look down in verse 24. And Saul said to Samuel, I've sinned, for I've transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Then he says, I pray you pardon my sin and go back with me that I may worship the Lord. But look in verse 28. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day. And he had amazing prophetic words. But because of his heart, because he wouldn't change, because he still saw himself, you know, the way he was, not the way God had called him to be. Uh, he says, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbour of yours who's better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not lie or repent, but he is not a man that he should repent. And verse 30, Saul said, I have sinned, yet honour me now, I pray you, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me, that I may worship the Lord your God. He no longer recognised the Lord as his God. He said to Samuel, the Lord your God. So there was no repentance, he just wanted to continue to look good in the eyes of the people. And in verse Samuel 16, 7, the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his appearance or at the height of his stature, for I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees, for the Lord looks on the outward appearance. The man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And this is the key. Everything must be heart to heart communication with the Lord. It must be heart to heart. The Lord looks upon the heart. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Keep your heart with all diligence, but out of it flow the issues, the borders, and the boundaries of life. And it's your imagination that paints the, the border or the frame of your heart. That's why we've got to come to the place of the Word of God. That's why there are areas in our life where we're not flowing in what we know God has called us to. And you know, He's not withholding it. It's the choices that we make sometimes. But I'm speaking to you now that there is a, 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 a window of opportunity, not a window of opportunity, because we've got a better covenant and a more sure guarantee. But I'm speaking over all of you that there are things that you have lost. Things that have you feel like, well, I know God promised it, but I've never seen it, it's never come, I don't understand. Well, I'm telling you now, if you will stop, and if you will say, God, I repent of everything that I have done to not walk into the fullness of what you've got for me, that I speak right now, God, that I open up my heart, I open up my soul, I ask the Holy Spirit to come in, I ask him to paint upon my imagination what you see for me, how you see me, my identity, my position in Christ. I ask you to change me, to turn me into another man, like when happened when the Holy Spirit came upon Saul. I'm telling you now that when you step into this, that there will be a release upon you that you've never seen. You will see a release in your families. You'll see a release in finances. You'll see a release in ministry. You will see a release. And when you stop seeing the... Because the, um, some of you see... Uh, some of you see like the, the, uh, the witchcraft that comes against you. You see the... Um, the attacks that come against you, and it's almost like that is painting an image on your heart. You shouldn't see those things. What you should see is the victory of Christ. You see the victory of Christ, that he defeated Satan, that he defeated everything, that you stand in the victory of Christ. And if you see anything coming against you, know that it will dissipate before it reaches you, because not one weapon formed against you can prosper. You walk in the fullness of all that he's called you to walk in. It's a time to let go of being carnal, of being um, self Protective self has to go. It is a time to rise up and walk in the fullness of all that he's called you to be. Because God is wanting to paint new pictures on the inside of you. He's wanting to release a destiny imagination within you. Where you will take hold of what he says. You say, yes, but that's what I see. I see myself living in divine health. I see myself flowing in divine wisdom. I see a divine prosperity flowing through my hands. I see myself, my hands being blessed in everything that they do. I see the favor of God upon me in every situation 
circumstance. I see um, the ungodly bowing before me, not before me, but before the Christ in me. I see these things. I see them. I know that it's true. That's when things start to change. When you know that you know that you know that your family, as for you and your family, they will serve the Lord. Yeah. And I've got some kids in my life that do not look like they are ever going to serve the Lord. But let me tell you, they will serve the Lord. God's going to get them good. Because I see it. I see them serving the Lord. I see them prostrate before Him. I see them worshipping Him. I see it. So what do you actually see? Do you see peace in your life? Do you see provision? Do you see wholeness? Do you see healing? What is it that you actually see? And what is it that you actually speak? Because what you see and what you speak come out of your imagination and frame your life. And God is wanting to do a new frame. He wants to reframe. He wants to frame you. God wants to frame you. So there are things in us that we have, um, we've received as kids that have framed us. Words that were spoken over us by other people that have framed us. Circumstances and situations that were worse than we ever thought would be have framed us. We don't want to go there, don't want to be involved, don't want to touch that. It's time to ask the Holy Spirit to destroy the frames and just ask God to build His.